Hey, Valorize Church, we're so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. We cannot wait to be with you in our new building. For now, let's get ready to worship. And I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me. Won't fail me now and in the waiting. The same God that's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will let you hide in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. And oh, Christ 
puts me in the fire. I'll rejoice because you're late too. And be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, you can't hang me there with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you, I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing And my song will be the same I'll sing and know Christ be magnified Just let his praise arise Christ be magnified be magnified in me. See, there's nothing worth more. If there's nothing worth more that would ever come close, nothing can compare. You're our living hope and your presence. I've tasted it too. And I've tasted and seen all the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is under.
time to sit back, relax, grab your coffee, get ready for a great Sunday message. Hey Valley Rise Church, welcome to Sunday service. We're so glad that you chose to join us this morning at Valley Rise. Hey, if this is your first time watching us this morning, my name is Pastor Christian Aranza and I moved here almost three years ago along with my wife and three children to start Valley Rise Church. We came to Tomball, Texas and fell in love with this area and we're standing currently in what will be our future building. We're a few weeks out from this and if you watched the last couple series, you saw we had some setbacks and our water heater exploded and the devil is working overtime to keep us out of here, but hey, God is working on our behalf to get us in here. So I'm so excited. I can't wait till we're all in here together. That's going to be the happiest day of 2020 for me personally. I can't wait. Hey, you're jumping into the great time. We're in our series, Give Thanks. In the thankfulness season, the season of harvest, the harvest season that, that starts in October and goes through until winter. And I am so grateful for this season. Not only is it my birthday in this season, but all the great holidays are in the season. I mean, you've got October and Fall Fest and Halloween and dressing up and all the fun stuff that goes along with that. And then you get Thanksgiving a couple weeks later and you get to eat and stuff yourself full. And, and my birthday's there, so I just celebrate another little thing in October. And I love harvest season. But I believe there's something attached to it that happens when we become thankful in our harvest season. So this series, Give Thanks We're In, is all directed about posturing our heart to have a heart of gratitude, a heart of thankfulness, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of 2020. How many of you know you still got some things to be thankful for in 2020? We're going to talk about that. I can't wait to share with you what I believe God has for us this morning. Let's pray and we'll jump into it. God, this morning we're so thankful. We're thankful for your love, your mercy, God. We're thankful that you choose to speak to us. God, we're so thankful that you're a loving Father, that you reach down and you impart your revelation into our hearts. God, we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts, give us revelation to see, God, to see you clearly, to hear your word clearly. Let us grow. God, let us not just be hearers of the word, but let us be doers of the word. We love you, Jesus. We're thankful for you this morning. Bless our time together in Jesus' precious name. Amen. What do you think of when you hear give thanks? Maybe you think of your, your Thanksgiving prayer. Maybe you think of Thanksgiving season. Maybe you just think about giving thanks at your meal time. You ever, you ever sit at a table with somebody who gives like too much thanks? Like they pray and they just like keep praying. Like my grandfather was like that. When he would pray before Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners, we would all get together. I'm a Cajun. I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana, and we'd get together every Sunday as a giant extended family. The Cajun culture, everyone goes to your grandma's house on Sunday afternoon, and she cooks for everybody. So there'd be about 30, 40 people up in the house my entire life every Sunday. 
And you'd get in there, it'd be time to eat, and we'd all get in a huge circle around the living room, and my grandfather, who's now gone to be with the Lord, would go, okay, I'm going to pray. Now, when Gramps prayed, you were just, you, yeah, you, if you were hungry, you might as well just pass out, okay? Because you're not getting out of there anytime soon. We pray for everybody, all 40 people in the circle, the neighbors down the street, the guy at the grocery store who helped him bag the turkey. I mean, like, it doesn't matter. He was praying for everybody. Lord, help Christian be obedient this Thanksgiving. May he not do something foolish. I'm like, I'm right here, Gramps. Like, we don't even need to pray about that kind of stuff. We would do all kinds of prayers. Finally, he would say amen and we'd be able to eat. Maybe you've been at a table and somebody has to pray that's never prayed before. Maybe you've seen some funny giving of thanks. Prayers are, are always so funny and it's fun. I love, um, one of my favorites is the childhood prayer. Probably all of us are. Now I lay me down to sleep. If I die, well, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray my soul the Lord to keep. If I die before I wake. When I'm a kid, I'm praying, I'm going like, what are the odds, God, that I die before I wake? Like, every time I said it, I'm just going like, is, it, is that something I need to say every night? Is there a possibility of this? Like, where am I at? That's a scary prayer for a kid. But all of it catered around God, and we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for the day. We want to thank you for our meal. We want to thank you for our family and friends. We want to... But I believe praying and giving thanks has more to do with just what we have. More to do than just the material possessions attached to the giving of our thanks. We see Jesus give an amazing example of this. They ask him, they say, Jesus, how should we pray? Teach us how to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're going to learn to pray from somebody, Jesus is a great person to learn to pray from. And Jesus begins to lay out what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. That reminds me of Boudreaux and Thibodeau, the two Cajuns, Boudreaux and Thibodeau. Boudreaux and Thibodeau were talking, and, and Boudreaux said, Thibodeau, tell me this, you ever talk to God? He goes, oh yeah, I talk to God. I talk to God all the time. He said, well, what do you say when you talk to him? He said, well, I, I call him by his name, and then I ask him for the things I need. And he goes, well, I call him by his name, too. He said, well, what name do you call him by? He said, I call him by God. What name do you call him by? He goes, no, no, I mean, I call him by his real name. Thibodeau said, what? how do you know his real name? I mean, what is it? Is it Lord? Is it King? Is it God? He goes, no, it's Howard. He said, his name is Howard Boudreaux? How you got, who told you that God's name was Howard? He said, well, Jesus did. He said, you show me that in scripture. He said, I'll tell it to you right now. Our father who art in heaven, Howard be his name. <laughs> hey, we all know the prayer. Our father who art in heaven, Howard be his name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What is he saying? He's saying give thanks for what God has given you today. He's teaching them how to pray and he gives them an amazing example of what giving thanks looks like. I don't believe the Lord's Prayer was intended to be a prayer we prayed all of the time. I don't think Jesus said, hey, here's how you pray, and you pray this every time. What Jesus was really doing was giving us an outline of how to pray, how to connect with God, our Father who art in heaven, how to connect relationally with God, position ourselves as his children. Okay, and then there's a, I can, we're going to do during 21 days of prayer, we have a whole section that prays through the Lord's Prayer. and breaks down every single section into what Jesus intended us to be praying for in those sections. It's one of my favorite prayers to pray through in the prayer book. But Jesus gives them an amazing example of what prayer looks like. Then we see Jesus do things that only Jesus can do. John 6 is where I want to teach out of today. Verse 1. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the lake of Tiberias, which is also known as Lake Galilee, the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Galilee. And a massive crowd of people followed him everywhere. They were attracted by his miracles and, and the healings they watched him perform. Jesus went up the slope of a hill and sat down with his disciples. Now it was approaching the time of the Jewish celebration of Passover and there were many pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem in the crowd. As Jesus sat down, he looked out and saw the massive crowds of people scrambling up the hill, for they wanted to be near to him. So he turned to Philip and said, where will we buy enough food to feed all of these people? Okay, now that's a good question. If you're hosting an event and all these people start showing up at your house, maybe you've hosted an event and, and maybe you plan for five and ten show up. And you ever look at your wife and go, what if, we, we didn't plan for ten, what are we going to do? 
Okay. Well, they had a little different scenario because they planned for like a few and 5,000 men, which really means about probably 15,000 with women and children showed up. And they're watching throngs of people come up the hill to sit down and listen to Jesus. And Jesus looks at them and says, hey, how are we going to feed all these people? This is the best part of this story. Verse 6. Now Jesus already knew what he was about to do. But he said this to stretch Philip's faith. Hey, I just want to say, I could preach the entire message. This is not what my message is about. I could preach the entire message off of this one line. Now, Jesus knew already what he was about to do, but he said this to stretch Philip's faith. Hey, how many times is Jesus already working on your behalf and you're asking some questions and maybe you just need to realize God is working on my faith? And God is stretching me. And so when I go, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. And God goes, how do you think you're going to pay that bill? And you go, I don't know, God, that's why I asked you. Hey, God already knows what he's going to do in advance. He's prepared in advance good works for those who love him. Okay, so that means that he already knows where the miracles are at. He already knows when you need it most. He already knows what your darkest day is going to look like. He already knows all of those things. He knows in advance what he's about to do on your behalf. Maybe you're in 2020 and you're going, Christian, I feel like that. I feel like all, a lot of need, okay, all the people where I need, and I've got little to give them. Maybe it's your job and you feel like there's a lot of need, but man, 2020 has taken a toll and you have nothing to give them. Maybe, maybe it's your family and they've got a lot of need, but you feel like, man, I've got nothing to give them most days. I'm exhausted, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm stressed. I'm, I have all these things, Christian, and there's a need greater than what I can supply. How many of you know whenever there is a need greater than you can supply, Jesus is already working in advance to do good things for those who love him and do his will? That means when you reach that point of, Jesus, I don't know what I'm going to do, maybe God hasn't forgotten, maybe he's stretching you a little bit. Maybe God hasn't abandoned you, maybe he's working some things out in advance and he's growing you from the inside out. I believe that Jesus was teaching the disciples the same thing that we often learn in our walk with Jesus, which is Jesus is working in advance on our behalf and he's growing us at the same time. So he asked Philip, what are we going to do? He already knew what he was about to do. Philip answered, well, I suppose if we were to give everyone only a snack, it would cost thousands of dollars to buy enough food. So Philip is coming up with his best plan. Okay, God, here's what I'm thinking. If we go out and we just get everyone a Lunchable, four people can share a Lunchable. We'll get the pizza ones. They can each get a pizza, okay? There's like four in there, so if will four. And then, Jesus, if we do that, it's still going to cost us way much more money than we have, Jesus. <laughs> okay, so they're trying in their own strength, their own might, to figure out how to solve this problem. I want you to stop for a moment, and I want you to think about what problem you're trying to solve currently in your life right now. What, what crisis of your faith are you trying to solve right now? I had a conversation with a friend today, and as we're talking, he goes, Christian, I just feel like I'm almost at that place where I'm frustrated and aggravated with God. And then he said, no, that's not it, Christian. I am at that place. I am frustrated and aggravated with God. What do I do? I shouldn't feel this way. And I stopped him. I said, time out. I think that's exactly where you should be. Because oftentimes when you're there, it's when you are the most genuine with God. It's when you're the most vulnerable in your relationship. And sometimes, like C.S. Lewis says, we have a habit of thinking our, worst, our best prayers are good. They're not. Our worst prayers are often the best prayers we pray. The prayers when we're at the end of our, our rope. The prayers when we're exhausted. The prayers when we have nothing left. Oftentimes, those are the best prayers. Philip's there. Philip's frustrated. Philip's trying to process in his own mind how to solve the problem. Philip answered, I guess if we give everybody a snack, it would cost thousands of dollars to buy enough food. But just then, Andrew, Peter's brother, spoke up and said, Hey, look, here's a young person with five barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would that go with this huge crowd? So Peter goes, hey, listen, Jesus, we don't have a lot. We don't have fish. We don't have snacks. We don't have... There is one kid here, Jesus, and he's got five loaves of fish, five loaves of bread, and two fish. And I think, Jesus, we could just cut it up real small. 
Like, like you have to imagine Peter's joking. They're standing there with 15,000 people, and Peter goes, we got a guy, we got five bread loaves and two fish, Jesus. What can we do with that? The beautiful thing about Jesus is Jesus can work with whatever you put in Jesus' hands. Jesus can work in whatever you put in Jesus' hands. If it's your work situation, Jesus can work in it. If it's your family situation, Jesus can work in it. If it's your personal issues, Jesus can work in it. If it's relational issues, Jesus can work in it. It requires us to put it in his hands. Peter says, Jesus, we've got a boy here. He's got five loaves and two fish. But Jesus, there are 15,000 people here. What are we going to do? Just then, Andrew Peter's brother spoke up and said, Look, a young person with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far would that go with this huge crowd? Have everyone sit down, Jesus said to his disciples. So on the vast grassy slope, more than 5,000 hungry people sat down. Jesus then took the barley loaves and the fish and gave thanks to God. So he gets up there and he goes, God, here's what we have. Now remember, Jesus is all God. Jesus could go, God, fish, and fish just would rain out of the sky. God, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A would rain out of the sky. And he probably did that at some point. I don't know if it's scriptural, but I just believe because we know that Chick-fil-A is the Lord's chicken. That sometime he had to make Chick-fil-A rain from the sky. I don't know about you, but that's the miracle I want to witness. So he goes, God, he could do anything. He could say anything and provide for them. He could say, be full, and they would instantly be full. So that means if Jesus chose to do this this way, there's something he wants us to learn from it. Jesus takes it and goes, God, this is what we have. It's not enough in our own strength. But God, you are enough. God, you are enough. I may not have enough or I may not be enough, but God, you are enough. And he gives thanks. He breaks the bread have everyone sit down, Jesus said to his disciples, on the vast grassy slope, more than 5,000 hungry people sat down. Jesus then took the barley loaves and the fish and gave thanks to God. He then gave it to the disciples to distribute to the people miraculously. To distribute to the people miraculously. The food multiplied with everyone eating as much as they wanted. When everyone was satisfied, okay, so stop for a moment. It does not say when everyone was full. It does not say when everyone got a piece. It does not say when everyone had a chance. It does not say when the basket passed by everyone and if you didn't get some, that's your fault. No, when everyone was satisfied. How many of you know when you eat from the bread of life, when you spend time with Jesus, when you're in proximity to Jesus, when you're allowing the greatness and the goodness of our God to surround you, you are satisfied from within. You are satisfied from within. So it says, when everyone was finally satisfied, Jesus told his disciples, now go back and gather up the pieces left over so that nothing will be wasted. The disciples filled up 12 baskets of fragments, a basket of leftovers for each disciple. So think of this. Not only has Jesus just done something amazing, but then they all leave there with a memento. All 12 disciples are leaving there carrying a basket that they saw Jesus only have five fish, five loaves, and two fish, and now they each are leaving with a basket full of food. Okay, They are carrying the miracle that Jesus just did with them. It was symbolic. There was a reason Jesus did that. There was a reason those 12 baskets left over. Jesus didn't overshoot by 12 people. Okay, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. They filled up the 12 baskets. I love that Jesus didn't just say, hey, throw it in the ocean. It's good. Everybody ate it by full. No, Jesus said, we're not going to waste anything. How you know God never wastes anything? God doesn't waste your pain. God doesn't waste your heartbreak. God doesn't waste your experience. God doesn't waste your time. God doesn't waste your relationships. God doesn't waste your money. If God is, took, is taking you through something, it's because he wants to do something in you and through you. If he's working on you currently, that's okay. It means he wants to do something in you and through you. And as we continue to allow God to do that in us, he doesn't waste any of it. Every part of your story, the part you think no one wants to hear, the part you're worried about people hearing, God has a way of using them all with nothing left over. I think there's something amazing that happens here that we miss. Jesus takes it and he breaks the bread and he does all of this, but there's something that happens that turns the food from five bread, two fish, to everyone's full and we got 12 baskets left over. 
Okay, something happened. It required something to take place. What happened? One, they put it in Jesus' hands. Hey, if there's something that you're holding on to today, let's put it in Jesus' hands. If there's a weight that's bugging you, a thing that's weighing you down, an argument, a frustration, an anxiety, a stress, a weight, a depression on you, let's put it in Jesus' hand. Because the first step for any relief in our life is to put it in Jesus' hand. And until you figure out that piece, none of the rest of it will ever make sense. If you're here today and you've never had a relationship with Jesus, maybe you've experienced church or religion, but you've never had a relationship with Jesus, and life has been hard and you've been frustrated, I'm not saying that becoming a Christian makes your life amazing and you're going to leave here and have a million dollars in your checking account and everything's going to be fine. But it does begin to all make sense when you finally put the main piece where the main piece belongs. It starts with us putting it in Jesus' hands. And then Jesus does one thing. He gives thanks. He breaks the bread. He gives thanks. And then God does what only God can do. I want to give you three things today that I believe happen when we give thanks. When we give thanks with whatever's in our life, in whatever situation we're in, because remember, we're reading this going, this is an amazing miracle. How awesome. I mean, he just, why that was so awesome. You know what wasn't amazing? The families that were walking up the mountain with their five kids that had been walking for days, and now they're hearing Jesus, but they're starving to death. And the kids are going, Mom, we're hungry, Dad, we're hungry, we haven't eaten this long. That's what we're going to do, we're so hungry. That wasn't cool. That wasn't the other side of the story. That was worry. That was anxiety. That was families dealing with frustration. That was people on the mountainside grumbling and complaining. That was, like, that was very real need. And Jesus puts it in his hands. The disciples put it in Jesus' hands. Jesus gives thanks. I want to talk to you about three things that happen when we give thanks real quick. As we give thanks, Jesus gives thanks, breaks the bread, God does a miracle. The equation is the same then as it is today. I want to say this, as we're talking about gratitude, as we're talking about being thankful, as we're talking about, and listen to what I'm about to tell you, because it will benefit you in your marriage, it will benefit you in your friendships, it will benefit you at your job, it will benefit you with your parents, it will benefit you in every walk of life if you will absorb only the next sentence I say out of everything. Gratitude is only gratitude when it's voiced. Gratitude is only gratitude when it's voiced. Any married couple knows what that's like. I come home and Alex has dinner ready and it's amazing. I walk in and our bed's made and the, the clothes are folded and it's amazing. And I think to myself, this is awesome. I got a great wife. Pretty amazing. Dinner smells awesome. Clothes are folded. Bed's made. She's fine. Everything looks amazing. This is awesome. Sit down. I eat the meal. Oh my goodness, this meal's good. Woo! My favorite meal. So good. So good. I get in bed, I'm, hey, mama, you looking fine tonight. Lock that door, baby. Woo! Good meal, all the chores done, me and you, baby. Hey, how many of you know she's going to look at me and go, did you notice I did, like, a lot around the house today? I, like, cleaned the broom, I, like, folded the clothes, I, like, had dinner ready. When you walked in, you could smell I'd mopped and taken care of everything, and the kids were ready for bed, and, like, did you notice that? Oh, I noticed it. And then she'd look at me and go, then why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you say thank you? And in my mind, guys, I know, because I have this conversation with you all the time. I'm the same way. I'm going, I don't, I don't know why I didn't say that, because I thought it. I thought it so much. I walked in, and I thought, I'm so thankful. I, I went in my room and saw the folded clothes and thought, thank you. God, my wife's awesome. So I looked at her. I said, thank you, Jesus, for making her fine. I smelled the food. I said, thank you, Jesus, for giving me a wife that can cook food. Okay. All of the I was thankful inside. But if I don't ever voice my gratitude, it's not gratitude. And I believe there's probably relationships in your life that are suffering because maybe you just haven't started to voice the gratitude yet. Maybe you've thought it. Maybe you feel the same way about your wife I'm describing. When's the last time you told them? When's the last time you said, I just want to thank you for all you do, man. Thank you for working so hard. Wives, when's the last time you told your husband, thank you for working so hard. Thank you for being a good man. Thank you for spending time with the kids. Thank you for... If we begin to live lives of gratitude, okay, if we'll begin to voice our gratitude to people, I promise you it will greatly impact and change your relationships. Let's try voicing our gratitude. 
Three things that happen when we're thankful. Number one, when I am thankful, I always have more than enough. When I am thankful, I always have more than enough. What do we see? Jesus shows up, there's not enough, not enough at all. Jesus gives thanks, all of a sudden there's enough for everybody. Because I think really what he's trying to say is gratefulness has more to do with what's in our heart than what's in our hand. Gratefulness has more to do with our attitude and posture than it does what's actually in front of us. And so there's many a night I've laid in bed going, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. I don't know, man, I'm worried about that person. They're sick. I'm worried about... And I have a little routine I do. It's my thing. You can steal it if you want. I lay in bed, and when I start, my mind starts running like that, and I'm laying there looking at the ceiling, I have built in a reflex that I immediately remember, I'm under a roof. I'm under a roof. Which means I'm better off than like 70% of the world because I'm sleeping under a roof in a house with air conditioning. God, I'm so thankful. God, I'm so thankful that I'm going to wake up under the ceiling, not the stars. God, I'm so thankful that if I'm hot, I just turn the air down. I'm not laying out sleeping in, in the middle of the woods. I'm not sleeping in the wild. I'm not in some place that doesn't have air conditioning. God, I'm so thankful. How many of you know by the time I work my way through my list of things I'm thankful for, my children are upstairs sleeping. God, thank you that they're healthy, man. I'm so thankful. I don't know what I would do if something happened to one of them. God, I'm so thankful that they're healthy. As I begin to work my way down my gratitude list, all of a sudden the things I was worrying about pale in comparison to the things I'm grateful for. And all of a sudden, no matter what happens with those things, I have more than enough. When I am thankful, I always have more than enough. My level of thankfulness is directly tied to my level of gratitude. My level of thankfulness, sorry, my level of thankfulness is directly tied to my level of contentment. My level of thankfulness is directly tied to my level of contentment. You know what that means? I will be as content on the inside as I, as, as I am thankful on the outside. I will be as content on the inside as I am thankful on the outside. So if you're feeling discontent, if you're feeling like things aren't happening your way, and you're frustrated, you're, hey, start voicing some gratitude and watch how your perspective and situations begin to change. When I'm thankful, I always have more than enough. Number two, when I'm thankful, I value things differently. When I am thankful, I value things differently. Okay, Jesus, now, instead of going, y'all just throw the rest of the crumbs in the ocean, that's okay, you're good, everybody, everybody ate, you got some, you got some, okay, good, everybody ate, if I take some leftovers, okay, good, all right, just throw the rest of the water, they're good, let the fish eat. Now that's what he said, he goes, hey, if, if, if God did this, Okay, we're going to be thankful for it, and I'm going to value even the crumbs because I remember that God did this amazing miracle for me, and so I'm going to value it differently. I'm not going to be frivolous with it. When I'm thankful for it, I value it differently. Maybe you've heard it said this way, you don't know a good thing until it's gone. You don't know a good thing until it's gone. What does that mean? It means oftentimes we don't stop and be, and we don't stop and have a moment of gratitude until it's too late, and what we should have been grateful for is no longer there. We've all encountered that. We've all been in friendships, relationships, jobs that you hated in the moment, and when it was gone, you thought, God, that was actually a really good thing. How did I miss that when it was in front of me? My level of contentment is directly tied to my level of thankfulness. I value things differently when I'm thankful. I wrote this down. When I train my mouth to be thankful, I train my heart to be grateful. When I train my mouth to be thankful, I train my heart to be grateful. Because as I'm thanking, baby, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for doing this. All of a sudden, my heart is going, God, man, we have a great family. Look, look at this. You've got a great wife and all this. Look at all she's doing. As I'm thanking, my heart is growing in love and gratitude and contentment with what God has put in my life. When I'm thankful, I always have more than enough. When I'm thankful, I value things differently. Train your mouth to be thankful, and it will train your heart to be grateful. And then number three, as I close, when I'm thankful, it guards my heart. When I'm thankful, it guards my heart. How many of you know the enemy didn't get kicked out of heaven for lust? He wasn't like, look at that fine angel over there. When God turns his back, I'm going to kiss that girl. No, that's not what got him kicked out of heaven. 
He got kicked out of heaven because he was lying, even though he's a liar. Okay, he wasn't like, hey God, I saw Michael the Archangel over there and he was stealing some uh, heavenly cookies, so you should probably do it there. That's not what got him kicked out of heaven. What got him kicked out of heaven, the Bible says, was pride. For a moment, he thought he was the equal of God. And as soon as he thought it, he was reminded that he was not the equal of God. He was the enemy of God. It was his pride that put him there. When I am thankful, it guards my heart. Because you know what the truth is about gratitude? It's hard to be thankful and prideful at the same time. It's hard to be thankful and prideful at the same time. It's hard to act arrogant towards others and also go, thank you so much for all that you do, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for showing up and serving today. Thank you for coming and helping me with this today. Thank you for cooking a meal for me today. Thank you for uh, folding the clothes today, baby. Thank you, kids, for cleaning up your room. Thank you. It's hard to be prideful and thankful at the same time. When I am thankful, it guards my heart and gratitude forces me to uplift others. It forces me to. When I go into a situation every day with an ideal mindset of gratitude, okay, God, I'm going to be thankful for everything I have. It requires me to lift other people up. Because I'm walking around now, and now when someone does something for me, hey, thank you so much, you're awesome at that. I really appreciate that. All of a sudden, I elevate them a little. I pick them up a little. Hey, as I'm thankful and as I live a life of gratitude, not only does it change my heart from the inside out, not only does it transform my situation, not only does it change the way I value things, but it lifts up everyone around you. How many of you know in 2020, we could use some lifting up? As I close, the Bible tells us, God gives grace to the proud, God gives grace to the humble, but resists the proud. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Hey, I don't know about you, but I want to have the relationship with God like Jesus did. When I go before God and go, God, I'm so thankful for what you've given me. And this is what's in my hand, God. I'm going to take what's in my hand. I'm going to thank you for it, and I'm going to give it to you. And God, I know that my less than is more than in your hands. I know that my too little is great in your hands. I know that what I can't see on the other side of this miracle, you're already working on my behalf. It requires my heart to be thankful. It requires me to place it in Jesus' hands. And it requires me to watch God do what only God can do. Hey, in 2020, harvest season, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to begin to live a life of gratitude in this season and just watch how it changes your surroundings. Live a life of gratitude. When's the last time you walked in and told your boss that you, hey, hey, thank you for hiring me. I just want you to know I just love this job. Thank you for doing, you know, thank you for putting up with me. I appreciate it. Even if you've been putting up with them, even if they're the ones that are trouble, even if it's been frustrating working for them, even if I had to poke myself in the eye with a napkin, listen, be thankful and it will change the circumstances around you. I'm so thankful that this napkin just poked me in the eye. Even in bad things, as I'm thankful, God is working through them. Hey, how many of you know oftentimes God is just waiting for some gratitude from our hearts before he does a miracle in our lives? Jesus takes what he has. He gives it to God. Shows gratitude for all that God has done and all that he is. And then God does what only God can do. Would you bow your heads with me? Today, God, we're so thankful. Jesus, we're thankful that over 2,000 years ago, you looked down and you saw that we were lost without you. That we needed you, Jesus, or else we would be sheep lost without a shepherd. And Jesus, you gave your life up for us to come down and to be with us. So thankful. Today, Jesus, we take a moment and we just give you gratitude. We just say, God, thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for putting breath in our lungs. Thank you for health in our body, God. Thank you for the state we live in, the city we live in, the friends you've given us, God. Thank you for a church family and a body that encourages us. God, thank you for so many people that you've brought into our lives. God, we are so thankful today. God, we just let you know that we love you, we're grateful, we put our lives in your hands. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, there may be some of you here that say, Christian, that sounds awesome, but I've never had that moment with God. Maybe I've gone to church or I've encountered religion, but I've never had a moment where I connected my relationship with Jesus, where I gave my life over to him and put it in his hands so that he could do what only he could do with my life. 
Today, if you want to make that decision, we're going to pray in a second. I want you to repeat after me. You can pray it out loud. You can say it under your breath. You can pray it in your heart as long as you mean it is what I ask. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, today, I recognize my need for you. But Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came from heaven to earth to live a perfect life. Jesus, a life I never could have lived. Thank you for doing it for me. And Jesus, I believe you went to the cross to pay for my sins so that I wouldn't have to. Jesus, thank you for paying my sin bill for me. And Jesus, I believe you went to the grave and on that third day you rose from the dead to bring me new life, hope, and freedom. Today, Jesus, I choose you. I choose to love you. I choose to serve you. I choose to worship you. And I choose to live a life of gratitude. A life of gratitude towards you, Jesus. Bless our people. Watch over them, protect them, and keep them. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, if you just made that decision for the first time, I am so proud of you. You just made the greatest decision of your life. If you would love some more information on how to continue taking next steps down that road, we want to help you with that. If you would, reach out to us. You can message us on any of our social media platforms. You can email me personally at christian at valleyrisechurch.com and just say, hey, I took my next step and I would love some more information on how to get plugged in. We want to make sure that we get you a spiritual family that you can do life with and walk this road with. I believe that when God opens this up, you're going to meet your best friends that you don't even know yet. Hey, Valley Rise, none of this happens without you. We're so thankful for each and every person who continues to invest into what God is doing here as we cross this line, push this ball across the finish line. Y'all have been amazing. I am so thankful for y'all. I am so thankful for each and every one of you who have invested in sacrifice so that we could build what we're standing in right now. From my heart to yours, if I haven't said it a million times, I want to say it a million and one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you came prepared to give with your uh, tithes and offerings, you can go ahead and get that ready. we got three ways that you can invest in the Valley Rise Church. Give back to God, your tithes and offerings. Um, you can mail a check to the mailing address on the screen. You can text Valley Rise, the amount to 77296. Or you can go to valleyrisechurch.com and click the giving link. Hey, everything you give goes straight into making this happen. And we're so thankful. You don't give to a church, you give to God. At Valley Rise Church, we always say, we will never ask you for anything. The Bible says every man should decide in his own heart what the Lord would have him give. So what we say here is you pray, whatever God tells you to do, that's what we want you to do. We know that God's going to take care of us. Hey, I'm going to pray over this and I'll let you get out of here. Dear Lord Jesus, today I'm so thankful for each and every gift and every giver. Jesus, we know that all good things come from our Father in heaven above, and so we return them back to you, God. We invest into your kingdom. God, this isn't our church, it's your church. When we give, we give to you, God. God, give us the wisdom to use those resources. Give our people, God, return it to them a hundredfold. Bless them, God. I pray every single promise attached to giving and tithing in the scripture, God, is poured out upon their lives this week. I pray that they would experience your grace on a new level. I pray that you would return to them a hundredfold, God, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing in their lives. Bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. God, bless them. They're going out and they're coming in again. May everything they set their hands to, seeking first the kingdom of God, may it flourish and thrive. Bless our people. Watch over them. Protect them. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, Valley Rise Church, I love you so much. I can't wait to see you right back here next Sunday, 10 a.m.